the um, familiar faces. Paul Leblanc, Antonietta, uh, Jérôme. And meeting new people, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, a few Dianas, of course. Nice. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> so New York, Toronto, Montreal, nice. <clears throat> It's been so much fun meeting people from all over. This conference has been bringing people from everywhere. There we go, Auckland. That, that, may, that may win it for furthest away. That's really cool. It's Dubai. Dubai, nice. <laughs> Planet Earth. <laughs> Bonjour, Jamaica. It's awesome. We've had such an amazing following from Jamaica. Yes. Nice. People are really um, trickling in by the second. Okay. So maybe I'll wait a few seconds. Yeah. I would also <laughs> love to go to Jamaica. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, Naya, was anyone else from the team? You said there was another Diana who came in? Yeah, uh, that's Teresa. Oh, nice. Okay. Thanks, Teresa. Hey, I didn't realize. Okay, great. Okay, so maybe I should Toronto. Nice. Um, okay, so maybe we could get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Power Skills 2020 five day virtual conference. Today is already day three of the conference. And if you've been participating in other sessions, we hope you're, you've been feeling as energized as I am. If it's your first session, welcome. You're going to absolutely love this session. So please check out the full calendar of all of the rest of the sessions happening until August 8th. My name is Emily. I work as a career advisor in the McGill School of Continuing Studies. Career Advising and Transition Services Office, also known as the CATS Office. I'm here today with my colleagues, Niall and Teresa. I don't know if, she, if, if you're there, Teresa, you can just say hi. And hi, everyone. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and some session rules for today are, well, rules, just how it's going to go about. Uh, the session is 60 minutes long. You'll be muted, and you can unmute yourself whenever we open up the questions. Um, it's going to be a, an engaging session and videos can be on or off, but it's always nice to keep them on, but no pressure. So when planning for this conference and we were putting together our list of leading speakers and master relationship builders, we needed to have people who were really at the top of their game. And so ladies and gentlemen, our speaker today is none other than Austin Belkak in this highly actionable session called How to Land a Job Anywhere Without Applying Online, Austin breaks down the formula for building job-winning relationships. These same strategies have helped him land uh, interviews and offers at Microsoft, Google, and Twitter. And they've helped thousands of his clients land jobs at the world's best companies without even applying online. So for those of you who don't know Austin, he is the founder of cultivatedculture.com where he helps people land jobs they love without traditional experience and without applying online. His job search system stems from his own personal experience transitioning from a new grad with a biology degree, a 2.58 GPA and a job in healthcare to landing interviews and offers at Microsoft, uh, Google and Twitter. His strategies have been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, Fast Company, Inc. And he also helped thousands of job seekers and uh, job seekers land jobs at places like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Salesforce, LinkedIn, Tesla, SpaceX, Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, ESPN, the NFL, and more without applying online. So, You'll see for yourself. You'll, you'll really enjoy the session. Austin, I can't tell you how lucky we are to have you here with us today. And thank you once again for joining us. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Emily. I, I really appreciate it. That was a generous introduction, so no, no pressure to, to live up to it over here. 
Um, but thank you all, and thank, thanks, thanks to McGill for, for having me. I'm really excited to be here to talk about one of my favorite topics, which, which is relationship building, and then how that fits into the umbrella of landing jobs in today's market, especially uh, you know considering what's going on with COVID-19 and just the job market in general. So just to fill in on, on that intro a little bit, uh, I do two things I, right, right now. I currently work at Microsoft. And I've been there for about five years and I work in partner development for Microsoft. So I essentially go out and I find partnerships who, uh, with, with companies who will go basically resell and, and be evangelists for Microsoft's advertising products. And I started there about five years ago. I've been on that team for five years. Uh, I've been promoted uh, since I've been there a couple of times. Uh, I also had the chance to meet Satya Nadella through one of the awards that I won. Uh, it's been a really, really fun ride. And then outside of that, I run a business called Cultivated Culture, and the whole ethos of Cultivated Culture is teaching job seekers uh, how, to, how to land jobs without applying online. And so that is mainly what we're going to focus on today. And when I say I help you land jobs without applying online, a lot of people look at me and they say, well, how is that possible? You know, what, what, do, what do you have to do to make that happen? And really, it comes down to building relationships. So there are a lot of components in the job search, right? And typically what we're told and what I was told is that the job search is a numbers game. So you tweak your resume, you tweak your cover letter, you apply online and you just keep doing that until something sticks, right? And that doesn't feel great a lot of times. What ends up happening is that we usually have to settle for a job that just decided to take a chance on us. And so I have a really good friend. Her name is Madeline Mann and, and you should all definitely follow her as well. She has a great YouTube channel, a great LinkedIn channel, but she kind of coined this term, um, which she calls hitchhiking through your job search. And that is essentially when you just stick your thumb out, you're just throwing applications out there and you hope somebody will take a chance on you. So that is what most people do. And that is just not the best way to go about it in today's market. So but let's, let's talk about some data. Uh, because I want you all to understand why we're taking this approach. Because what happens is the reason so many people apply online is because it's familiar. It's this process that we're told by everybody that, that we go to for advice. And just because everybody is doing something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. But I want to show you why taking the leap and kind of, you know, putting your faith in this process is worth it. So according to the most recent data that, that I can find, as of right now, 75% of applicants use online applications as their primary means of getting in the door for jobs. That's how they apply for these jobs. That's how they go after open opportunities. Um, but if we look at the success rates, only about 2% of people have or get interviews when you apply online. So 75% of people are competing for that 2% number, right? And then only one person's gonna get hired. So when we think about the average job, the data shows that the average role gets 250 to 350 resumes right now. And that basically means that, you know, of all of those resumes, 2% is such a small number, right? It's like, you know, four to six people roughly in that ballpark. And of those people, only one is getting hired. So the, the odds are just so, so low when we apply online. And the big problem is that people are spending so much time applying online. And we'll talk about that in a second. So what else can you do? Well, if we look at where the numbers are better, right? Because we're talking about online apps and how poor the odds are, let's continue you know, with that results-based approach and go look at some of the data on where the hires are coming from. And it turns out that most of them are coming from uh, referrals. So the data shows, and it depends what source you look at, a lot of the anecdotal sources that are coming out you know, more recently show that it's within the range of 60 to 80% of referrals coming from, from hires, sorry, 60 to 80% of hires coming from referrals. Um, but the, the lowest number that I've seen is 40%. And that lowest number is still double all of the channels that make up online applications. So job boards um, or, you know, like recruiting firms and, and stuff like that who are funneling and sifting through these online applications. Um, all of those channels combined are right around the 40% mark, which is just made up by referrals on their own. But only 7% of applicants make up referrals. So essentially, when you're applying online, you're competing with 75% of the entire job market for a 2% chance of just getting in the door, not even getting an offer. And that is a really tough game to play. There's a lot of competition there. Whereas if you start focusing your energy on building relationships and landing referrals, 
you're competing with 7% of the applicants for anywhere from 40 to 80% of the hires. So what does that mean? Well, it simply means that going after the referrals is just going to be a much, much higher ROI activity for you, much, much better use of your time. So that's great to know, right? But how do you do that? So I was giving a, a workshop at Duke University down in, in North Carolina in the US uh, pre-COVID. And when we started the uh, when we started the workshop, I asked a question. So I'll ask it now. I'll pull up the chat and we'll, we'll see uh, how many of you all feel this way. But um, raise your hand or just put in the chat, yes, if you've heard of the term networking in any capacity. So I'll, I'll just give you guys a second to do that. Okay, we got a lot of yeses, perfect. So that was my first question. Everybody in this workshop said the same thing. There were, every hand went up. So then I asked a second question. And that is, let's say that uh, you want a job at Microsoft and you've, seen, you've identified me as the potential hiring manager. How many people, and you can say, uh, you can either say yes or no. So how many people feel like they know the exact steps that they would take to feel confident in building a relationship with me as a total stranger and landing a referral? So if you feel confident, you can say yes. If you don't feel confident, you can say no. Okay, so we got, we got a ton of no's. No. And that is the problem, right? So when it comes to building relationships, this idea of networking and relationship building is just like shoved down our throat by everybody. You hear it from, you hear it online in articles you read, you hear it on LinkedIn, you hear it from career experts, but the follow through isn't there. Nobody is stepping up to say, hey, here's how you do it. So that's what this session is gonna be 100% focused on. I'm gonna walk you through my formula for building relationships. And my hope is that when you leave this session, you feel like you have some very concrete steps that you can start go, going to take action on and you can start seeing results from, from those actions. And eventually you'll be able to generate some referrals and you'll be able to get in the door with these companies. So to start, I think the best thing um, to, to know is just, how this process works and why it's so effective. And I think one of the best parts about it is that we gain back some control. So with the online applications, you just throw stuff out there, right? And you have the worst part about it is like, you have no idea, like you could apply to two jobs or 20 jobs or 250 jobs. And if I asked you how many interviews would you get out of that? You probably couldn't give me an, a confident answer. You probably wouldn't have any idea. So the great part about this process is that we actually take control over each step and we understand what the numbers look like so we can back into uh, the first step and, and then we can essentially swing the odds in our favor. So I work in sales at Microsoft and every year Microsoft comes to me and they say, hey Austin, you have to go sell X dollars worth of Microsoft products or you can find a job somewhere else. They don't, they don't say that, it's a little bit nicer, but that's essentially the, the vibe. And so I need to come up with a formula that will allow me to hit those numbers without having to rely on a white whale or without crossing my fingers. So what I do is I start with the, the, the end goal, the closed deal where Microsoft gets the dollars. And I look at my historical metrics and I say, okay, for each step in the sales process, what are my success rates? And so if I need to close this many deals to get that many dollars, how many of this first step do I need to take? So we can extrapolate that to the job search process. So let's say that you wanna get two offers. You know, you wanna have some options, you wanna be able to negotiate and your success rate from final round interviews to offer is around 33%. That means you need around six final round interviews to land those two offers. So not every interview you get is gonna be a final round interview. It's just the, the nature of the beast. And so we need to buffer that a little bit. So we need to increase the number of first round interviews we get in order to land those final rounds. Let's say your success rate there is also 33%. Uh, that means you need to get 18 first round interviews to get those six final rounds to get those uh, two offers. But we're getting most of those interviews through referrals. You know, it's totally okay to apply online and we'll talk about how to split this out in a second. But most of those referrals should be coming or most of those interviews should be coming from referrals, which means we need to talk to at least 18 people. But again, not everybody we talk to is gonna refer us in. So we need that buffer as well. And really what that turns out to be is in the ballpark of around 30 to 50 conversations, which sounds like a lot, but I don't mean conversations as in like an hour long Zoom call that like we're all probably dreading at this point. Like a conversation can happen in many ways. It could be a phone call, it could be a Zoom call, it could be an email exchange, it could be an exchange on LinkedIn. We just need to have 30 to 50 touch points with these people so we can build the relationship. And relationships can be built 
over Zoom. They can be built over LinkedIn. They can be built in the comments. Um, uh, and by in the comments, I mean in LinkedIn, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. But relationships can be built in many ways. And we just need to be building around or connecting with 30 to 50 or so people in order to get those 18 referrals, 18 interviews. But not everybody we reach out to or try to connect with will be receptive. And so we need to buffer that as well. So when you're doing your outreach, when you start, you're typically going to see like a 10 to 15% response rate. You'll be able to boost that up to in the ballpark of 25 to 35 using some techniques. And I'll show you how to do that. But based on those numbers at 25 to 35, if we want to have 30 to 50 conversations, let's say the high end to be conservative, we need to reach out to around 150 people or so. That's really the sweet spot that I found from my data, which shows that the odds kind of shift in your favor. So if you hit up 150 people, you have 50 conversations, you get 18 referrals, which turn into interviews, you get those six final rounds, you get one to two offers. So that means that if you take that first step of sending 150 emails, you can feel pretty confident that you're going to get something out of that in terms of results. And the cool part is all of those, all of those statistics, all of those rates and at, at each step, you can keep track of your own. So all the ones that I shared are just averages that I've seen with the clients that I've worked with, but you can keep track of your own and that allows you to tweak every step in the process. You know, if you're getting crushed on the conversion of conversation to interview, that means you know you need to do a little bit of work there. And that's great to know because that's so much more information and feedback than you get from the online application. Because, you know, is it your resume? Is it your cover letter? You know, sometimes we go as crazy as to say, like, is it because I use size 12 font instead of 11? And like, you're not getting, you're not not being hired because you use size 11 instead of 12 or whatever it is. So we just have so much more control with this process, with this system. And that's the starting point, those contacts. So how do we back into 150 contacts? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, and actually this is a really interesting question um, from Jerome or an, an inter interesting statement. It's certainly better to be extroverted than introverted. That's not necessarily true in this case. This works for both introverts and extroverts. Uh, and it works equally well because we're building one-to-one -one relationships here. You're not going to meetups, you're not handing out business cards, you're not like commenting on those weird posts that are like every connection is valuable. So like throw your name in the comments and whatever. Like we're building one-to-one -one, like really personal and strong relationships here. And we're going to be doing it in such a, it, it, we're going to be doing it in such a way that you know, there's not going to be a lot of pressure and it's not going to be you having to perform on a 60 minute, you know, informational interview. These relationships are going to be built in the same way that we build all of our relationships in our life. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. But when we think about finding those contacts, the first step is coming up with your target companies. Because at, at the end of the day, the, the worst part about applying online, I have said the worst part, there's like so many bad parts about applying online. One of the worst parts about applying online is that you, again, are just going so wide. You're going 100 miles wide and one mile deep on each of these companies. Because at a certain point, you just get fatigued, right? You're tired of building that resume from scratch for the 100th time. So you just swap out a few words or whatever it is. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, here are 10 to 15 companies that I would kill to work at. Like, these are my dream companies, hands down. And I would do whatever it takes to work with these companies. And so we're going to select those companies. And there is, there are, we could spend a whole session on how to choose those companies. Um, I have a lot of information about that on my site. But hopefully, you have at least a couple in mind. So you could use those as, as an example. But what we're going to do is we're going to come up with that list of 10 to 15 companies. And I don't want you to settle. I want you to pick companies that you are super excited about. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go find 10 to 15 people at each of those 10 to 15 companies. And so you have 10 companies and 15 people, or you have 15 companies and 10 people. That's your 150 minimum. And again, that 150 number is just the minimum. One of the big flywheels in this process is the more people you reach out to, the better your chances of success. So if you want to add more, feel free to do that. But the first step is coming up with those 10 to 15 companies. Then we're going to go use LinkedIn to find these contacts. So one of the big mistakes that people make is they reach out to the obvious person. And that typically is a recruiter or somebody in HR or that person whose face is like right next to the job posting. And people say, well, I'm reaching out to people. Like, it's not working. What's going on? And that's because you and a million other people who saw that job had the, the exact same idea. So when you reach out to recruiters, there's two reasons why that is not your best bet unless you want to be a recruiter or you're going for a job in recruitment. But reaching out to recruiters is, is tough and not, not necessarily worth it in a lot of cases for two reasons. So one, these recruiters get 
blown up with emails. Their inbox is stacked with all these other people who had the exact same idea that you did. And they have just started reaching out to this person. So their inbox is totally slammed, which means whenever something's competitive, as you've seen with online applications, you have to do even more work to get noticed and you're not always guaranteed to get noticed. But let's say you do, let's say that you do get noticed and the recruiter pulls you out of the crowd. They can get you an interview, but they can't influence the final hiring decision, which is what really matters. So if they get you in the door, that's great. But who's sitting across from you? A total stranger who's never met you and who doesn't really know much about you and who you sort of have to build a rapport and a relationship with from scratch. And then when they're in the room where the final hiring decision is made, that recruiter isn't in that room. The, the team of people who interviewed you is. So rather than going after recruiters or folks in HR or people whose picture is posted right next to the role, let's go find somebody who might be able to influence that hiring decision. So the best person is the hiring manager, right? And we have like, you can think about it like a series of concentric circles. So if we have the hiring manager at the center, that's the, that's the person. And if you can get in touch with them, amazing. Are you going to be able to do that consistently? Absolutely not. Like it's, it's really just your best guess. So we expand out. What's the next ring of people who can influence this? Well, it's people who would be on your team, who would be your colleagues sitting next to you, your peer on, on this specific team. And then that next ring out are people who are on similar teams or who would work with you tangentially if you got that role and so on and so forth. So that's how we're gonna structure our 10 to 15 contacts. And the way we find them is just by using LinkedIn. So we're just gonna hop on LinkedIn and we're gonna take that job title and we're just gonna plug it in and we're gonna use some of LinkedIn's filters. So if I typed in account manager on LinkedIn, um, it's gonna take me immediately to the jobs page. So I need to go and click the people button in the upper left-hand corner. And then I need to use the filters. So maybe I'm looking for a job at, I'm throwing this out there, at Spotify in Montreal. Well, maybe I click the Spotify filter for uh, on the companies and maybe I click Montreal and locations and then I'll play with it a little bit. Maybe I'll go see using the university filter if there are any McGill alumni there. Or maybe I'll go see if anybody came from using the past company filter, if anybody came from the company that I'm in. But the goal here is to really dial into the people who have the most influence over your ability to get hired. Because building relationships takes time and it takes effort and it's a lot more intensive than just going out there and throwing out a bunch of online applications, but your chances of success are so much higher. So using that method, we're going to find the 10 to 15 people and we're going to go do that across the board. So now we have our 150 contacts and this is where the fun stuff happens. So peeling back the layers um, on, on relationships, just taking it all the way back to the relationships in our lives. I want you all to picture somebody that you have a really good relationship with. And I, it would be better if you pictured somebody who is not a family member or somebody who is not, you know, your partner um, romantically in some way, but just somebody that maybe a friend or maybe a colleague or maybe somebody that you look up to. And just think about a couple of reasons why that person, why you have a good relationship with that person, like why that person came to mind. So I'll give you a second to do that. And then next, I want you to think about somebody that you have a bad relationship with. So somebody that you know that when you think of them, like your blood kind of boils and like you sort of get this feeling in your stomach and you're like a little upset even thinking about them. And then I want you to think about why you, or, or I want you to think about why you labeled those people as a good relationship and as a bad relationship. And what I'm going to do is lay out some criteria here. And then you can either tell me in the comments or you can just, you know, think it to yourself whether the things that you assign to this person fit these criteria. But we'll start with a bad relationship. Bad relationships tend to, uh, first, they tend to be one-sided. So one person shows up when they need something and they pretty much only show up when they need something. And they always ask something of you, but you know, when you show up and ask them for something, they're never around. You know, they're always doing something else or you know, they're always too busy or whatever it is. Um, on top of that, they tend to be convenient. That person tends to show up when it's convenient for them. You know, they're nowhere to be found in the interim, but then all of a sudden, oh, this project is late or, you know, that test is coming up and they need that study guide, whatever it is, it's convenient for them to show up. Um, and then on top of that, it tends to just be like a series of, of one-offs. Like these people are showing up out of the blue. There's no consistency. There's no rhyme or reason. So, those are some of the criteria of bad relationships. And some of the criteria of good relationships are you know, pretty much the opposite. So usually good relationships are, start with value. So somebody did something for you. You know, maybe they put in a good word for you with your manager, um, or maybe they offered to refer you into a job. 
Or maybe you needed a little extra help on that project so they stayed late to help you. Or maybe they were going to pick up coffee for everybody in the office and they got you one. You know, anything, even the small stuff um, can, can really add up, but they led with some sort of value. And then the second piece is that that value was almost altruistic. There was no expectation of reciprocity right off the bat. You know, they didn't turn around immediately and, and say, well, I helped you with that project. So now I need help with this and you better do it because I helped you first. Um, that doesn't happen. And then third, these relationships are typically built on common ground. So there's some sort of common goal, there's some sort of shared interest or values. And all of those things can be fair game when it comes to common ground. You know, typically two colleagues or two people in the same industry might find common ground on the fact that they're both, you know, working to grow their company in the same industry. Uh, or maybe you find somebody else at a bar and you're talking to them and you have shared values politically, whatever it is, a lot of good relationships can be formed on those things. And then finally, repetition is huge for relationships. So I can picture all of my best friends right now and not one of them became my best friend because of one call or one meeting or one beer at a bar, or one instance, whatever it is. They all slowly gained that title through continued interaction and through layers. And so you can sort of think like building, you can sort of think of good relationships like brushing your teeth in this sense. You know, you don't brush your teeth once for eight hours, you know, once a month for eight hours, and like you hope it's good. Like you brush it every day for two minutes, twice a day, um, and that's how you know you keep your teeth clean. That's how we foster good relationships as well. So the point that I'm trying to make here, and I don't know if any of those labels uh, kind of you know found their way to the person that that you were thinking of for either the good relationship or the bad relationship, but really what it comes down to here is if you want to build good relationships, good relationships are on uh, they're they're built on the basis of adding value without the immediate expectation of reciprocity. And you want that value to be aligned with the other person's interests or goals. So that's where we'll start. And there's basically two things. If we want to add value that aligns to the other person's interests or goals, we need to know what those interests or goals are. So there's two pieces that we're going to focus on here. There's the professional piece and there is the, the personal piece. So professionally, you just want to get out there and research their company. And this is something that you want to do anyways. But our whole goal here is to have a deep understanding of everything that we, we can possibly know about their company. Where are they at? Are they doing well? Are they not doing so well? Uh, what are their goals over the next six to 12 months? What initiatives are they driving to hit those goals? What challenges are they facing? What does their vision for the future look like? What does their culture look like? We want to know all these things ahead of time so that when we engage with this person, we're able to connect on a deeper level than just kind of showing up and, and throwing out some basic questions. So what I found is that when we start doing some of the outreach, the people who are willing to help are willing to help. And what I mean by, by that is, you know, if somebody was going to be willing to help you no matter what, they'll help you no matter what you send them. But the level that they help you and the depth that they go is determined by how you show up. So if I show up and, and I'm like talking to myself and I'm like, hey, Austin, I saw that you're a partner manager at Microsoft. Like, what does a day in the life of a partner manager look like? I'll answer that for you. But is that really going to forward the relationship? Maybe, probably not. But if you showed up and said, hey, Austin, I was listening to Satya Nadella's keynote at you know, the recent Microsoft conference that happened a couple of weeks ago. And he said something really interesting about the advertising space. And he talked about how Microsoft advertising is releasing this trusted news source or network. And you know, as a, a partnerships you know, business development person, how is that impacting your team's you know, go-to-market strategy? How are you using that to sell? Now, all of a sudden, I'm saying, whoa, like, you did a ton of research. Like, you, you, you invested time in learning about me and what I care about. I appreciate that. I'm going to invest deeper in you. I'm going to give you more info. I'm going to give you more access. I'm going to give you more insight. So really what it comes down to is if you want like the quote to put above your desk, um, what I always say is if you want 15 minutes of my time, show me you spent 15 minutes to get it. So if you want 15 minutes of my time, show me you spent 15 minutes to get it. That's what I want you to have like burned into your brain. If you don't take anything else away from this session, that is super, super important. And so what we want to understand is as much about their company as we possibly can, and as much about the personal side of things as we can without being creepy. We'll talk about that. So on the company side, there's a couple of ways to, uh, and so Stephanie just, just mentioned exactly what I called out. So we'll talk about not being creepy in a second. Um, because you don't want to be creepy. That is not a good way to build relationships whatsoever. 
And so the way that we approach the company side of things is I'll just run through these quickly because uh, we could spend a lot more time on them, but listening to company earnings calls. So if, a, if there's a publicly traded company, they're required to have a quarterly basically conference call where they share all the stuff that we just talked about at a high level. How are they doing? What were their results? Where are they going next? What challenges are they facing? Um, so listening to those, they're publicly available. You can just type in the company name and investor relations and they'll pop right up and you can go listen to them. They're usually like 30 to 60 minutes. Sometimes they have a slide deck, a transcript. There's a lot of good info that comes out of those. Next, I'd recommend also for public companies going and checking out a site called seekingalpha.com. Um, and so I can, uh, I can try to put it in the chat here, um, seekingalpha.com. There we go. Um, and so this site is essentially like a, a financial news site and a, and a financial blog like mashed into one. So the way it works is uh, you have, when you go to Seeking Alpha, you type in the company's name, you go to their profile on the right side, um, it has news about the company. And on the left side, it has analysis about the company where these financial analysts will tell you what they think about the company, where it's going to go, et cetera, et cetera. So reading into those will give you opinions uh, or give you an understanding of the opinions that are out there, the things people are talking about and the way that they believe the company is going to go. So you can arm yourself with this information. Moving on to uh, some strategies about private companies. And, and I'm going through these strategies. I'm assuming that you guys are reading through the company website and reading through their social media feeds and doing all of the, the basic stuff that a lot of people are doing uh, naturally when it comes to company research. But private companies, um, the thing I, I love most uh, is listening to interviews with executives. So going and basically all you need to do is go to Google and type in company name and leadership team. So if you're going to use my company, Cultivated Culture, you can type in Cult Cultivated Culture Leadership Team. Um, we're a one person company, so you are looking at him. But in most cases, there's a whole suite of C-level folks, VPs who manage different parts of the business. So you want to find a person who is aligned to your side of the business and you want to go look up interviews. So go ahead to YouTube and type in that person's name and then interview. Go to Google and type in that person's name and podcast. And rinse and repeat until you find some people who are talking about the business for 30 to 60 minutes. Um, you're going to get so much information out of those interviews that you wouldn't just get in a news article. And then finally, if you have time for this and you are up for it, it's probably the most effective strategy that I've found that you can bring to the table. But go survey and research their customers. So go talk to their customers, go use a Google form, go call some of their customers up, go read through reviews um, if those are available on an app store or something like that. Uh, There's so many different ways to, to collect customer feedback, but customers are going to give you the best insight into a product and into, you know, their pain points and what they love and what they don't. And don't just stop at this company, like go look at their competitors, customers, go talk to their competitors, customers. Uh, that takes a lot of time. I can tell you that it's worth it. Uh, but that is usually, uh, I'll tell you this, the people who invest the time in doing that typically see a much higher success rate than people who do not. So I would recommend it and I'm throwing it out there for that reason. But now you're armed with this information and what you're going to be able to do is show up and ask those deeper questions. And so to the point of being creepy, like in this case, you, you don't really have to worry about anything professionally for the most part. Typically people love when you show how deep you went on a professional side of things. So if I say, Hey, I listened to that keynote with Satya Nadella, or if I, if I say, Hey, I read through all the reviews in the app store, I actually went and talked to 10 people who use your product or 10 people who are in the market. People are typically like really blown away by that in a very good way. They're typically like, whoa, you really took the time again, take, you know, spend 15 minutes of your time to get 15 minutes of mine. You really showed up and, and delivered on that. So that tends to play really, really well. And that tends to be treated with a lot or greeted with a lot of respect. And again, like I said, the people are going to be willing to help the level that you show up. That is going to be really strong um, for you if you show up and you know a lot about their company already. And that will allow you to actually use the meeting to get some deeper insights from that person because you've already covered the basics on your own. You don't need to spend the meeting time digging that up. You can go deeper with this person. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. Next, we're going to go to the personal side. So what I like to do is just go ahead and type this person's name into LinkedIn. We already have their profile. So we're just going to go through their profile and look at, you know, we're, we're looking for points of commonality. So did they go to the same school? Um, is there anything in their about section that you can latch onto? Are they active on the platform? Do they post comments? Do they post original content? Do they engage with other people's? Going and looking through their work history just to understand what they've done before this. Do they have recommendations written about them? All of this stuff is really, really powerful and really, really effective and helpful for you 
in understanding how to inter interact with this person. So the next thing we're going to do is after you hit their LinkedIn profile, just run a quick Google search on their name. Go look for uh, personal websites or portfolios or other social media feeds and just give them a read. And I'm not telling you, and you should absolutely not do this. You, you don't want to show up and say like, hey, I saw that you had a great time at like Johnny's, you know, socially distanced party last Saturday. Saw you were drinking, you know, summer shandy. How was that? That's super weird. That's not our goal here. Our goal is to look at how this person presents themselves online and do two things. One, we're trying to find an angle in, and I'll give you an example or a couple of examples of this. We're trying to find an angle in. And then second, what we're trying to do is understand how to best engage with this person. Because the way that this person shows up online and the way that they, they present themselves can give you a lot of insight into them. If this person is super bubbly and they use a million exclamation points and emojis and all this other stuff, you may want to engage with that person a little bit differently than you might with somebody who is, you know, very short and very succinct and very stoic with their online presence. And so we're not using this information to be creepy. We're using this information to arm ourselves with the best path forward. We're, we're saying, okay, based on what I know about this person, here is how I think I can engage with them to build a relationship in the best way. And so that's where we're, that's where we're getting this info from. And so just to give you a couple of examples of on the personal side, how this might look, um, one, an example from, from my side of things, I had somebody, I, I get a lot of comments on LinkedIn and I'm not saying that to brag, I'm just, that, that, that is the case. And one person on one post led with this comment about hot sauce. And so I talk about hot sauce um, it's kind of buried in like one article on my site. I've, I've started talking about it more, um, but this is, I, I love hot sauce. That's where this is coming from. It's, I make it at home. We have a bunch of different types. It's a whole thing. Anyways, this guy found that piece of info in an article and he actually mentioned it in the comments on my LinkedIn profile and everybody else was commenting on the post or asking for advice or whatever. And this guy showed up and he offered kind of a refreshing breather for me because he showed up and talked about something that I'm interested in. So I responded to him. We went back and forth in the comments. And then two days later, he sent me an invite and said, you know, after two guys have bonded over hot sauce recipes on LinkedIn, the only natural next step is to connect. Like what a brilliant message, like what a brilliant way to get in front of me. So we connected and we went back and forth a little bit about the hot sauce stuff. And then he showed up and said, hey, by the way, I just got my, my permanent residency approved in Canada. And I was wondering if I could get your advice on this one thing. Was I happy to give him advice? 100% because he went out of his way to show that he invested in me and showed up for me before making an ask. So that's a really, really great way to do this. Um, another example is somebody who works on my team. His name is Dare Obasanyo, and he is a, par a partner program manager at Microsoft. And if you do a quick Google search for him, you'll find that he has a pretty active Twitter. He also publishes a lot of articles on Medium. Um, he has, he's just very active socially. And what we could do with Dare is show up on his social media feeds and just engage for a little bit. So whenever somebody's active online, we can just show up and not make an ask right away, but say, you know, leave a thoughtful comment on their, on their, one of their posts or one of their tweets or whatever it is. Um, maybe go take action on one of the things they recommend and then send them a DM and say, hey, I really love this advice. I went and took action on it. You know, here's what came out of it. And if we do that, you know, if I showed up on Dare's feed and I commented on maybe, you know, three of his posts a week because he tweets pretty frequently, and then I send him a message, all of a sudden, I'm not just a total stranger who's just showing up on, on Dare's doorstep asking for a meeting. I'm the person who's been positively engaging with him and supporting him on social, and he knows that he's probably going to recognize my name, my face, et cetera. So that's another way to get in the door here. And then a final example is I was coaching somebody who wanted a, a job in a support role at a company called Zendesk. Um, so you all may be familiar with them, but uh, what she did, she had a whole list of contacts like we talked about. And instead of just blasting out an email that said, here's my resume, here's my resume, can you help? We went through the list and we actually found one person who had a personal blog where, where they talked about their, their sort of takes and thoughts on the customer support space. Now that is like insanely niche and that will be you know one in your 150. But just for the sake of example and another tool in your tool belt, Instead of just reaching out with that, that resume or whatever, we looked through their articles. We found one that talked about how important empathy is in the customer support process. And we sent them an email and said, hey, you know, 
I, I was looking for people who were commenting on, you know, the, the support customer support landscape and who might have some interesting ideas for, you know, things we can do during COVID-19. I stumbled across your article. It's a couple of years old, but I honestly think that it's never been more relevant. I really think that you should update it. And if you think that's interesting, I'd be happy to introduce you to a couple of people who may be able to weigh in, leave some comments and also may promote it for you. And boom, that was that. Like they got connected and they started having a conversation. And so that's the type of stuff that we're talking about. Thinking about the other person first, doing your research and not being creepy, but using it as a way to connect, using it to find the best angle to get in the door with that person. So that's what we want to look for. Now, what I will say is that with people in general, um, or, or with internet communities rather, because we're doing a lot of this online, there's a thing called the, the 99 one rule or the 1% rule it's sometimes called. Um, and it has to do with internet communities. And it essentially states that in, a, a, in, in an internet community that's of a critical mass, 1% uh, of the people will be creating original content. 9% of people will be engaging with that original content and sharing it. And then 90% of people will be what's uh, affectionately known as uh, lurkers. So they just sit there and they observe and, and they don't really engage or connect or whatever. So you can apply that to your 150 contacts. You know, 1% of them or so, give or take, you know, five or 10 people are going to be creating content. And that's a super easy way to engage. You know, 10% 10, 10 maybe a little bit more on either end will be engaging with that content, commenting, et cetera, also creates an avenue for us to engage. 90% of these people are just going to be, you know, silently out there. And a lot of times you'll come to somebody's profile and you may not have a way to connect with them. So all we can really do is send an email or send a LinkedIn message. And so my best advice here is to make the email and the outreach about the other person. So can you find uh, a point of commonality? Can you reference something they've done? Hey, I saw that, you know, I'm looking for a job at Microsoft and Partnerships, and I saw that you made the transition from healthcare, Austin. I imagine that couldn't have been easy. I'd love to learn more. So typically what I say is, you know, if you were sending me an email, I typically say, hey, Austin, um, you know, we, we've never met before. Uh, I hope you don't mind me reaching out of the blue, but I found your contact info on LinkedIn while I was looking for people who insert your angle for people who made the jump to technology from a non-traditional background. I saw that, and this is where you personalize it again. I saw that you made the jump from healthcare to Microsoft. That was really impressive. Um, if you have a few minutes, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions about your journey. I'd love to learn what that journey was like, what the, like, I'd love to learn about some of the obstacles that you faced. Um, and then at the bottom, I always add an, what I call an exit clause in my emails. So a lot of people end their emails with stuff like, um, thanks in advance or looking forward to talking, or if you have five minutes, you know, let's set up some time on Wednesday. Instead, I say, I know this is a big ask and I understand your time is valuable and I know you're busy. If this is too much, that's totally fine. I understand, you know, either way, I hope you have a great week. And that actually tends to boost response rates when you acknowledge the other person for like being a human being and being busy, you know, that actually tends to play better than if you just showed up and said, you know, hey, here's what I need. So notice that I didn't reach out and say, there's this open role at this company, you know, here's my resume, can you refer me in? Or can you pass me along to the right person? Or can you give me advice? That's what I call a me mindset. And it really doesn't work out most of the time. And a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, but Austin, I've done that. I reached out to somebody at the company and passed my resume along and, and they referred me in. Like, what are you talking about? That's awesome, that is amazing. So if I went to Vegas, Las Vegas, and I showed up at the roulette table, and I put money down on you know, 18 red, and I hit it, I'd be like, boom, I'm, I'm gonna play this all night. I'm winning, like this, is, like, this isn't hard. I'm gonna keep winning, I'm gonna make tons of money. The odds are what we're playing here. And so the, you can do this test for yourself. What I always recommend to all my coaching clients is when you're starting out with cold email, you have 150 contacts. Choose two to three templates that have a fundamentally different approach. If you wanna take that direct, you have an open role, here's my resume, can you help me out? That's template one. Then with template two, let's make it about the other person. Hey, I saw that you made this interesting transition from X to Y. And let's send both of those out and let's see what the response rates look like. And I'm not telling you to stick with my recommendation if that's not what the data shows you. I can tell you that on the whole, that's what the data shows me. And that's what works out in most cases when we make, when we make it about the other person. But the biggest and best thing you can do is with any career advice out there, mine, anybody else's, take it with a grain of salt, go test it for yourself, keep track of those metrics, and then do what works for you. So 
that's what I would recommend. I think that if you start testing these emails over your 150 contacts, I think you'll find that if you make the outreach about the other person, you'll probably get some better outcomes. So the, the last thing I want to add about outreach here is following up. So many people just send one email and then don't get a reply and say, oh, you know, this person doesn't want to talk to me or I bothered them or I annoyed them or this is never going to work. And that is not the case. At the end of the day, we are all busy. You never know who you're emailing, especially right now. Like, did you email the single mom or dad with two kids at home who are being homeschooled? Did you email somebody whose company is worried about going under and, you know, well, hopefully maybe you dodge a bullet then, but, you know, maybe their boss dropped a bunch of, you know, projects on their plate and they're super busy. Maybe they're on vacation taking some, some mental health days. You never know what's going on on the other side. So we want to assume best intentions and we want to follow up every five business days. And you can be super casual about it. You can just say, hey, again, I know this is a busy time. I know your time is valuable. You know, getting emails from strangers is probably not something that happens every day. If, you, if this is too much to ask, I totally understand. But if you do have a few minutes to chat or if I can ask you some questions over email, I'd be super grateful. And that's it. You can just send that off to them. And every five business days follow up with them. In sales, where we do a lot of cold outreach, typically the, the email or touch point number three and four are really where the magic happens. So that means an initial email and two follow-ups is usually where the magic happens. So just keep that in mind. And following up is what's going to boost your response rate or one of the things that's going to boost your response rate from that 15% up to that 25 or 35%. One of the other things is making the outreach about these other people. So that's just a quick uh, overview of, of how we might engage. So what happens when you get these people on the phone? Well, there's two parts to the conversation. So the first thing and the, the biggest thing that you can do is set the tone of the conversation. So a, a big mistake I see is a lot of job seekers will show up. And they spend so much time trying to get on the phone and they pick up the phone and then they, they get nervous, which is fine. We're, we all get nervous. I, I had like butterflies in my stomach before getting on this, this call. And that just means that you care. That's nerves are a good thing. So don't fight them, embrace them, but have a plan. And that plan is going to simply be reiterating what you sent them in an email. Hey, Austin, you know, thanks so much for taking the call. I know you're busy. Uh, like I mentioned in my email, I was really impressed by your transition from healthcare to Microsoft. Can you take me back to the point where you made that decision? Why did you decide to leave healthcare? And I asked that question specifically for a reason. I didn't just ask, how'd you get to Microsoft? Because that fast forwards through a really big chunk of my story. And so by asking, about something that happened at the beginning of their story, which is when did you make this decision? You're forcing them to start at the beginning and you're forcing them to talk about themselves. And the reason why that's important is because there's some researchers at Harvard who did a study and they basically found that, or, or I guess to set up the study, they brought a bunch of people into a room and they offered to ask them questions either about themselves or about other people. And they paid them based on the questions that they answered. So it turns out that humans are willing to forego earnings. They're willing to forego money in order to answer questions about themselves. And that number actually went up the amount of money they were willing to forego. So it was, they, they were willing to forego 17% of their earnings uh, in order to talk about themselves. That number went up to 25% when they knew somebody else like yourself was listening. So the researcher said, that's really interesting. Let's dig into that more. So they ran the same study, but they stuck these people in a brain scanner. And what the scanner showed was that when people talk about themselves, the, the reward centers, the pleasure centers in their, in their brain lit up like a Christmas tree. And when, basically those centers are the same reward centers that light up when we are eating an amazing meal, when we are uh, in love with somebody or when we are on illicit drugs. So this is a really powerful thing. And not to say that making somebody talk about themselves is gonna make them feel some type of way, if you will. Um, but this is something down to the molecular level that, that we can capitalize on. So if I ask that question and I give this person runway, they're gonna start talking about themselves. And what's gonna happen is they're gonna warm themselves up just by telling them their story, just by talking about themselves. And so I'm gonna aim to ask some follow-up questions and keep them going for about half the call. And then in the back half of the call, I'm gonna transition to what we talked about earlier. Let me dig deeper into these insights. Let me dig deeper into the questions around, what's the biggest challenge your team is facing? Uh, you know, what initiatives are you really excited about or rolling out right now? Um, you know, what are some of your personal goals that, that you know, outside of work, what do you like to do? What, what do you focus on? What, what are you excited about for the next couple of months? All these things will help us get deeper insight into how we can add value later. 
And then at the very end of the call, well, not at the very end of the call, but at some point during the call, basically what, what happens is a lot of times we get to the end of the call, we ask all our questions, we hang up and we're like, man, that was a good call. And then the next day we wake up and we're like, I want to keep that relationship going. And you're like, but I, how do I do that? I don't know. What, wait, what do I say? Like, what is there left to ask? What is there left to do? Where's the window? So we need to create that window for ourselves. And there's two ways to do that. So one is, and probably the easiest one to use, is what I call the advice triangle. So at some point during that call, you're going to ask this person for a piece of actionable advice. And we'll talk about how to specifically do it. But essentially what's going to happen is you're going to ask for the advice and they're going to give it to you. And then after the call, you're going to go take action on the, the advice. And then you're going to follow up with what happened. You're going to give them the results. You're going to tell them what you did. And then you're going to ask for more advice. So now we've gotten ourselves into this triangle, this cycle where we ask for advice, we take action, we report back and we ask for more advice and then rinse and repeat. And that advice creates that opportunity for the next conversation. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, I don't know how many people here have heard of the names Eric, uh, Neil, Neil Patel or Eric Sue before. They're, they're two people in the marketing space. And if you have, you know, you can mention them in the comments or whatever. But I really uh, love one of their podcasts that they have called Marketing School. And I wanted to ask them a question. I wanted to build a relationship with them. So I sent them an email um, specifically to Eric. And I said, you know, hey, Eric, I was listening to this episode that you guys put out there. And I just have a super quick question for you. Uh, can you tell me, you know, here's, here's one line about my situation. Should I do A or should I do B? And A and B, A was something he recommended in the episode. B was another thing that they recommended, but I wasn't sure which to do. He replied with three words and no punctuation. We do A. That was it. So I took that and I said, I'm going to go do A. So I sent him that email on July 9th, 2019. And then I spent months going in and busting my butt in doing A and working to get results. And I got those results. And in October, I sent him a message back and I said, hey, Eric, I did A and here's what came out of it. Da, 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 da. They featured me as a case study on their website. And then I also came back a week later, Eric was releasing a new tool. And I said, hey, I'd love to give you some feedback. And I got on a 30 minute Zoom call with him. So the advice triangle can take your a three word answer with no punctuation and turn it into a 30 minute Zoom call with somebody who runs a podcast that has 30 million downloads and, and whatever it is. So you don't have to wait from July to October to make this happen. You can go, you know, if they give you, so, so basically what you're asking for are two things. You're asking for this or that advice. You're putting two things out there that are super actionable. So not, if you were to start over, you know, what journey would you take to, to get to where you are again? It's, hey, I want to turn myself into a stronger candidate for exposition. Would you recommend taking X course or reading Y book? Something super simple like that, something that they can answer in under five, 10 seconds. Um, and that's just going to make it super easy for them to come back and, and, and basically answer your question and give you that, that you know, bait for the advice triangle. The next thing that you can do is use something that I call a value validation project. So you guys can read more about it. I will throw it in the um, chat here. But essentially, a value val validation project is as close to a silver bullet as I found in the job search. And one of the biggest issues with the job search is that we don't really have a great way to illustrate our value. So we are forced into the box of this eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper called the resume and an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper called the cover letter. And we have to use a language that we've never, ever used before. And the problem is on the other side, you know, recruiters read a lot of resumes, but hiring managers really don't. And so the problem is I like, I like to think about it like if two people in New York sat down uh, at, at a table next to each other and they were both from different countries and English was their second language or let's say third language in this case for a, a better example. And they started having a conversation. They could still have a great conversation, but some stuff may get lost in translation and some stuff that may be important may get lost in translation. And that's nobody's fault. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in that case, but it's just the nature of neither party being super fluent in the language that they're using. The same thing happens on a resume. This language is like a second or third language to most of us. We don't use that weird buzzwordy jargon anywhere else, right? Like when we sell an idea or when we pitch an idea or when we want to do something, we talk like this or we put it in a deck or we write an email. And so that's what a value validation project does. It allows you to illustrate your value on your terms. So it's essentially, you can think of it like a pitch deck almost or a deliverable where you go take that opportunity that you found. 
what's that team's biggest challenge? When you went and surveyed their customers, what opportunities did you find? What data points did you, did you come up with? Um, what initiatives are they driving and can you add you know, value to that or can you give them feedback or suggestions? And then what you wanna do is put together this deck that offers that value and does it in a relevant way. So I'll give you a quick example. I had uh, a student from the University of Washington uh, in the Pacific Northwest US. Uh, she wanted to work at Microsoft. And so what she did, uh, she was going for a rotational marketing program that was for uh, new grads only. And there was a ton of competition. So instead of just relying on a resume and a cover letter, she went out and she said, okay, what, what product at Microsoft needs some marketing love? And at this time it was Microsoft Teams. Um, it was not, this is pre-COVID and, and things were a little rough for Microsoft Teams. So we said, okay, Slack, this competitor to Microsoft Teams has all of the market share. How do we capitalize on that? How do we, how do we take some of that market share and bring it to Microsoft? So she went out there and she did everything we talked about. She listened to earnings calls. She listened to interviews with executives. She went and surveyed customers, not just of Teams, but of Slack. And she learned what they loved and what they didn't. She poured through user reviews in the app store. And she turned that all into basically a seven slide deck. And the cover slide said three opportunities for Microsoft Teams to gain market share. So pretty catchy, you know, I'm interested in that if I work at Teams. Next, she has a quote from Satya Nadella talking about his vision for teams and why it's so important. So, hey, investing in this is worthwhile. The next slide was a, a quote from the magazine uh, called The Verge, which said, or the publication called The Verge, which basically summed everything up in one sentence. They said, Slack's biggest challenge is getting people to pay for its service. Teams' biggest challenge is getting people to love its service. So we latched onto that theme of love. How do we get people to love Microsoft Teams? Well, step one, most people using Microsoft don't know about Teams. They were thinking, you know, why would I send a message through Teams when I can send a message through Outlook? Or why would I host a file on Teams when I can host a file in OneNote? Why would I use Teams when there's all these other options? So one of the suggestions she came up with based on user feedback was an interactive map that you could pull up or showed up after you signed up. And it said, hey, here are all of our products and here's what they're really good uh, for. You know, so here's what you want to use this one for and here's what you want to use this other thing for. Um, so that was the first, uh, that was the first thing. The second thing, which is my favorite was let's get this in front of people where it's beneficial for them using Microsoft's existing ecosystem in business. The whole thing is, or, or the old adage is it's five times more expensive to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. So Microsoft had 156 uh, million. I always want to say billion. That would be a lot. Uh, so 156 million office users at this time. So how do you get more of those office users to use Teams? They already have it downloaded on their computer. So one of the big pain points that I've seen in my life is when I make a slide deck or a PowerPoint presentation and it's too big to email and I like want to pound my head against the table because I don't have an easy way to get it to the other person. Well, what if PowerPoint was smart enough to pop up a little icon that said, hey, this file is too big to email, but why don't you try sending it through Teams? And then maybe I send it to Emily through Teams and then Emily types back and says, hey, I love this, but on slide 10, I think we should do X, Y, and Z. And I type back and I say, that's a great idea. Let me make that fix. Well, now Emily and I are having a conversation over Teams, which is exactly what we want people to do. We're getting these people to use this product when it's beneficial for them. So that was the second idea. And the third idea um, was just creating a better mobile experience. Um, and I will uh, not dive into this too much because it's fairly straightforward, but we did a lot, we pulled a lot of data on how uh, mobile devices is where the internet is going and where traffic is going. And we said the, the mobile app is not getting the best reviews in the app store. So let's fix that. Let's do some focus groups. Um, let's get people in the door here. Let's get some analytics behind this and see how we can fix it up. So at the end, she said, you know, who am I to give these ideas? Well, here are my credentials. Here's a link to my resume. Here's a link to my LinkedIn profile. Here's some interest about me. And oh, by the way, I live down the road. Uh, that is not a deal breaker. Uh, you don't have to live down the road for this to be effective. She sent it out to all of these contacts that she found using the process we mentioned earlier. And boom, she got in the door for an interview and she ended up getting the offer. Why? Because her value was so much more tangible than everybody else in the process because everybody else was still relying on the resume or the cover letter. And so to wrap it up here, uh, the last thing I will say about value validation projects is a lot of people come to me and they say, well, Austin, I don't want to work for free. And what if a company steals my ideas? And I totally understand that. So I'll say two things. First, um, if you think that doing this is working for free, I would redefine your version of what free means. So the data shows that on average, when you switch roles, you have the chance to make anywhere from 10 to 21% in terms of a raise. That can actually be higher if you 
sell your value, maybe through a value validation project more effectively. But if you take your salary and you multiply it by 10% or 20% and you add that on, think about what that dollar amount is and think if that dollar amount is worth an extra five or 10 hours of your time. You tell me, calculate the hourly rate and you tell me what that looks like and whether or not that's worth your time. So that's the first thing I'd say. Um, and also understand that this isn't gonna work 100% of the time. So maybe you 3X that hour amount and you still do the math and I, I bet it still works out. But the second piece is that what if a company steals my ideas? This is bound to happen. And it is actually a great thing when it happens. Here's why. Because when you sign up to work at some place, you're essentially marrying them. Like you, for at least the next you know little while of your life, you're spending 40 plus hours a week there. You are depending on them to pay you and they impact so many aspects of your life. So if you're stepping into a situation where you're effectively marrying somebody who is stealing ideas from people who don't even work at the company to run their business, what's that going to look like when you actually work in that role? What's that going to look like when your manager continues to do that? They take credit for all of your ideas and you can never get ahead and you can never get visibility because this person keeps stealing your ideas or that teammate keeps stealing your ideas. What happens then? Well, passing on that job or not getting that job doesn't look so bad because what's going to happen is you're going to go find another job using these same strategies. And I know that sounds crazy because you're like, oh, I finally got the offer. Why would I ever give this up? But with this strategy, I promise you that you'll feel a lot more confident about creating a consistent pipeline of this stuff. You're going to go find a job that treats you well and pays you what you deserve and treats you the way you deserve to be treated and has the culture that really fits what you're looking for. And so if a company steals your ideas, uh, I actually view that as a plus because you dodge a bullet, which you did not want to be a part of anyways. So I would just keep that in mind. And once you create one value validation project, put it in your profile, put it in the featured section on your LinkedIn, you know, save it for later, use it as a template so that when you go for the next company, you already have that value validation project created and you can just swap out some logos and some numbers and stuff like that. So the VVP is pretty much the closest thing that, that I can think of to a silver, silver bullet. And so if you feel like based on where the conversation is going with this person that you're building a relationship with, if you think that you're in a good place to ask for advice from them, use the advice triangle. And if you think that you're in a good place to go with the VVP, uh, go with the VVP and, and take that route. But either way, you've opened the door for the follow-up two weeks later. And then it's all, at that point, it's all about being consistent with that value add. So find ways to add little layers of value. Check in with people. Say, hey, I, I know that we talked a lot about uh, meditation on our in informational interview. So, you know, I just started up this new app. Or, hey, I know you're running this event and this person over here has a great audience. Let me introduce you to them. Or, you know, hey, I saw that you're putting on this virtual summit. Let me go in, you know, for this McGill summit. Hey, Austin, let me go take notes on this entire session and send them to you in a PDF so you have them. You know, that would probably get on my radar. You don't have to do that. Um, but think of ideas or ways that you can add value to the people that you want to connect with and keep building those layers. And I promise you if that happens, one, you're going to get referrals right now, but also these people are going to be in your network forever. And so the next time a job opens up, the next time your job searching, you're going to have these people in your network and you're going to be able to tap them. So that is as much as we can pack into one hour on relationship building. And I know there is a lot of stuff that you all probably still have questions on. So I'm happy to stick around and I'm happy to answer some of those questions for, for a couple more minutes. Um, but hopefully this gave you guys some insight into a different way to think about not just job searching, but how you approach your professional life in general, you know, how you build relationships. If you want to start a company, if you want to start a side hustle, this stuff is going to come in handy for all of that. And this is really kind of that gateway to, I think, everything that you probably wanted in your career. So thank you all so much for having me. Um, thank you for, for dropping the links in the chat. And I, we can open up the floor to, uh, to some questions here. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think you blew all of us away. We're super <laughs> excited about all of the strategy and like super specific advice that you gave and you walked us through it. Uh, that's awesome. And you're just, I feel like I can hear you speak for hours. <laughs> that flew by. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. Everyone of is course. Any positive comments. We have just a few questions. Mm -hmm. If you do have a minute or some time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. So how do, how do these hire, so this is from Christine Carson at the very beginning of the session. How do these hiring trends vary by sector, especially in academia or in government? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so th they're a little bit, th those are two very, I would say niche and very different industries from each other and also from the, the private sector and everything else that's going on. So what I would say is 
these are still effective in, in academia. Um, I actually use these same strategies to land an adjunct professor role that um, with everything that happened didn't, didn't end up uh, being something that we wanted to go through with on either side. But I knew somebody there and I built a relationship with them and I added value ahead of time. And so when this role opened up, they came to me and asked me about if, you know, if I wanted to be a part of it. And so being an adjunct professor is not the only role out there in academia, but at the end of the day, you have to think about why companies hire. And these people are spending 40 hours a week with you. And on top of that, they're looking for results. So all companies care about at the end of the day is the person who they can really tolerate for 40 hours, but hopefully that they like spending 40 hours with and the person who will drive the most results. And the best way to convey that is through a personal relationship. People feel so much more comfortable taking a bet, taking a risk on somebody that they know, that they trust, that they've spoken to. And so this works really, really well across the board. In the public sector, you still have to go through the proper channels. In the private sector, a lot, a lot of times you'll circumvent the online application process through this. In the public sector, you're always going to have to submit an online application and go through the formal process. That just is what it is. But it definitely does not hurt to have somebody, you know, chirping in everybody's ear saying, Emily's great. Emily's awesome. I had a conversation with her and I think she'd be a great fit for the team. Like that all really adds up and that's going to be a bunch of points in your favor. So it really works across industries from what I've found. Um, you just have to understand the nuances of the industry that you're in. And the best way to do that, honestly, is to go out there and talk to people who work in that industry. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We have another one from... Um, Okay, from Niloy, I think that's the way it's pronounced. Uh, would you say that for successful networking, a rule of thumb is to really try to reach out as a person rather than as a professional? Um, that's a good question. Uh, again, I think it comes down to the best avenue that you can find. So like the interesting thing is a lot of people view the personal relationship side as like a weird thing. That's like way out of, like people are a lot more comfortable to connect on a professional basis than on a personal basis. But what's the first thing we do when we job search? Like we go look at where all of our friends are at and we see if we can get a referral from them. So I like to view this process as like potentially making a new friend. And a lot of people struggle. Like you see all the headlines, like making friends in adult life stinks. It's really hard. You know, it's almost, it seems impossible. So how do you do that? Well, this is one way to do that. You just take a bit of a different lens instead of like, you know, powering through for a referral. Maybe you are a little more casual and you just try to make a new friend, but I would view, I viewed all the people that I reached out to, when I reached out to them, I said, these people have something that I want in, in, in the sense of like, what they're doing is really cool. And I really respect what they've achieved. So I want to learn from them. My, my attitude wasn't, I want a job at Google and this person works at Google. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to squeeze this person until I get that referral. My attitude was, wow, this person works at Google. Like that is so cool. And they're young and they've gone through like this transition that I want to go through. Like, I want to learn from this person. Like I want them to teach me how to do it. And that's how I approach these relationships. And so I would say that the, the best angle is the one that is going to give you the best odds. And so if that's a personal angle, take the personal angle. If that's a professional angle, take the professional angle. You know, worst case, you end up with a new friend. You know, best case, you end up with a new friend and a new job. Like, it's, it's really looking at all of your options in front of you. It's like a chessboard. Like, there's a lot of moves to be made, but you want to make the best move for you. Absolutely. Um, we have another comment. What would you do for functions like learning and development that are less public if you want to look for great companies in this area and provide a value validation project? So it's all about thinking about, you know, what's important to a company. So wh why does a company um, want somebody in learning and development? Well, they probably want to uh, allow their employees to educate themselves and develop themselves, or they want to do that for clients. Maybe they want their clients to educate themselves and develop themselves. So let's say that it's clients. Maybe this person's being hired to create better trainings and, and all that good stuff for clients. Well, can you go to the company website and see who some of the clients are? Can you go reach out to some of these people at those clients? And just say, you know, hey, um, I'm, uh, and you, if you are a student, that's a great angle to take. I'm a student doing a research project, or you can just say, like, I'm doing a research project. I don't mind it. You know, I hope you don't mind me reaching out of the blue. Um, but we're really trying to understand, like, the types of training that, are, that, that 
you feel the best or most energized by or you retain the most or whatever, you know, here are a couple of questions or here's a link to a survey. Um, or you can be honest, you can say like, hey, I'm, I'm really excited about getting a job at this company and I know they offer you guys training and I want to learn more about how they can make their training better. So, you know, if you don't mind filling out this survey, I'd really appreciate it or I'll buy you a cup of coffee or whatever it is. And then you get a bunch of people to fill out the survey and then maybe you, you go look at the insights and maybe this company has a massive gap in X, like the training is delivered and everybody's psyched up, but then six months later, there's no action taken. Okay, so how do you bridge that gap? Well, boom, there's your value validation project. You come up with seven slides for a specific plan on how they could do that. So it's really thinking about, you know, at the end of the day, like if, if you could put what this role is going to do in the most simple terms, and then you can go, the world's your oyster. There's so much data out there. If you can figure out what this role is going to do. And then you can go find some ways to learn more about how that process works and how it's being executed at this specific company or learn from their customers or whatever it is. That's where the magic tends to happen with the value validation projects. And the best way to get better at them is to practice, like to just go out there and start building these projects. And, and the more you do it, the better you'll get. I love that. Thank you so much. Last question. Sure. Um, we want to know about you. Uh, I agree with this question here. It might not be totally, she, so, she, so Darius says it might not be totally related to the talk, but I'm curious about how you decided to switch from the health field in biology into working for Microsoft in sales. What made you make the jump? Sure. So uh, really what it came down to was at, at the core, it was that I just had no idea what I wanted to do. And like, we're asked this question, you know, from the, the moment we can like speak, everybody's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you can say like astronaut or professional soccer player or whatever it is when you're five and that's acceptable. But as we get older, things become less acceptable, right? And the scope narrows. And then, you know, the things that make people excited are lawyer and doctor and accountant and whatever else, you know, the TV careers. And there's just so much more out there that we're not exposed to. And so when I was in college, I had no idea what was out there. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I took this job and I was also lazy. I, I will say that as well. Um, so I just took this job that was dropped into my lap by my roommate's dad and it ended up being horrible. And I just worked in the field and my boss treated me like crap. I wasn't making very much money. But on top of that, I looked at like who was successful in this field and what were they doing? What was their life like? And that's not a life that I aspired to, to live in. So I thought to myself, well, what do I want to do? And really, at the end of the day, I wanted to be doing this. Like I wanted an online business and I wanted to be able to uh, you know, teach people how to do things. And I wanted to help people and make an impact. And I said, OK, well, if I want to learn how to create an online business, the best place for me to go is in, into technology where people have created online businesses. And then I said, well, I don't necessarily have the, the skills right now. So what do I need to do to bolster them? And so I, I walked backwards to a very first step, which is essentially, let me go out there and let me one, start building these relationships. But two, let me start building my skills. So I went out and I taught myself some digital marketing. I went out and I did some freelancing. Um, I built up some real results for myself uh, through that freelancing, through client success stories. And I brought that to the table with me. And, and that's what eventually, you know, ended, ended up selling me through. But at the end of the day, like, I, I wish I could say, like, it was because of this, like, amazing, you know, mission. But really, I looked at, like, the best companies in the world in technology. And I was like, I want to work there. Google, Microsoft, like, that's where I want to work. Um, and that's what ended up, you know, happening. So the best thing I can say, there's a great article on the site um, called, uh, I'll post the link in a second here, but it's called, what should I do with my life? And it basically walks through this whole uh, same, same level of, you know, actionable step-by-step -step that we just went through in this whole presentation. It, it gives you a framework for how to kind of go out there and figure out what career path is right for you and what, what you are actually passionate about. So I'll drop a link to that in the, in the chat in a second. Uh, but that's a great question. Thank you so much, Austin. You've been so generous with your time, uh, amazing energy, and just uh, we're so appreciative for the uh, practical strategies that you shared with the whole community. People are just so happy about all, like the comments are amazing. Um, and we're, everybody's really, really happy about your session. Thank you so much. I think they're going to be rewatching your session over and over again. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your, your good energy and amazing strategies to the Power Skills 2020 conference. We really appreciate it. And we really hope we can stay connected with you. Same here. And thank you guys so much for putting this on. The event is amazing. So many people are, are thanking you all. So, you know, big kudos to you all for everything you've done. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll be back for a round two. But until then, I hope you guys are safe and healthy. I hope everybody on the call is safe and healthy. And I will talk to you all soon.
Thank you so much. We have, uh, we're also going to be including your contact info in the chat and, uh, and we're, and we're wishing you a lovely rest of the day. Thank you so much. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Mayo. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure, everyone. Uh, to to well. follow. Yeah, so I'm just putting in his contact info there. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. And please stay connected to, to us and stay connected to the upcoming sessions for Power Skills 2020. And the last session is on August 8th. So we're so happy to see you here and uh, looking forward to seeing you. And it's the end of the third successful day. Uh, time to relax, logging out of Facebook Live, stopping recording.